Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Good? OK, good. So uh, my name is Jeremy Boxer. I am the curator for the uh, reality section here at Sonar Plus D. And what we're going to be doing today is uh, talking to Paul Raphael, who is one half of Felix and Paul. But before we start uh, today, I would like to ask you all a little favor for me. Um, on the count of three, can we all say happy birthday, Paul? One, two, three. Happy birthday, Paul. Thank you for Thank you. sharing your birthday with us. OK, so um, I think it's best that we start with, uh, you had a video that you wanted to share with us so we can get a sense for the people who are in the room of the, the type of work that you do. Sure, so uh, we're actually celebrating our fifth year anniversary uh, this year, and we made a video recently uh, that I think sums up everything we've done, and it's probably a good way to start uh, this talk. OK. Yeah. You want it? We're going to play the video now. Yeah. people's house and Michelle and I always joke uh, we're just renters here. Chief is a, a stray dog who has rounded up with all the dogs in the city. My name is Dennis. Dennis. I put something into you. Thank you. All right. So, you've been busy. <laughs> um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, your pre-VR days and how you and uh, your partner Felix got involved in uh, working together and, and moving into VR? So Felix and I have actually been working together for much longer than five years. Uh, we met uh, right after school. So we, we actually studied at the same um, university in Montreal, Concordia University. Uh, Felix was a year ahead of me. Um, so we met um, when he graduated and I dropped out. So we finished at the same time. <laughs> and uh, we were sort of bumping into each other in film, in film festivals. And uh, through some weird fluke on a um, music video project, uh, we were paired up 
um, to do this uh, animated music video. So I, we had never done animation, um, but uh, I had been dabbling in After Effects, and uh, we didn't really, we, other than having bumped into each other, we, we didn't really know each other. We were like, all right, sure, let's give this a shot. You know, it's like there was no money, so it'd be half the work. <laughs> Together. In fact, we were three directors. Uh, there was a, a third director, Tian Vu Dang, okay. uh, who was part of that project. Um, and we worked on this thing for about six months. Mm -hmm. um, I had a um, burnout at the end. It was my, <laughs> first, my first real professional gig, and I just yeah. went completely all out. Uh, but uh, the video was quite a success, mm -hmm. um, and people kept asking for you know, who did that? And uh, by that point, uh, Ten had gone on to do other things, but Felix and I had had a great experience working together, so we, we kept doing it, and we did more music videos, and then uh, advertising, and then short films. Um, eventually, we, we both had uh, a common interest in immersive storytelling, which for us at the time was just immersive films, like films that really, in which you really fall into the film more than more than films that were about the story, but more about the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, my, my favorite film of all time is Space Odyssey, and so I think that's a good example of that kind of film. Um, but we felt like these kind of movies, for some reason, weren't as accessible, and that there were probably ways to, to achieve that state um, in, in viewers through more immersive media. Mm -hmm. And so we started experimenting with um, Installation art. Uh, we did. Uh, we worked with the Moment Factory, Cirque du Soleil. We did some live shows. We developed some live shows with them. And eventually, in uh, I think it was 2009 or so, uh, we started experimenting with uh, stereoscopic projection. And, uh, th and this was really a uh, reaction to seeing some of the 3D. It was kind of the beginning of the 3D revival. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some shots in some films that I found completely mind-blowing. And they were usually the wider shots, the more sustained shots. And, and I was like, wow, this, the whole movie should be like this. Why are they cutting? Why, why are they, and then, you know, you'd have this one moment, and then you'd blah, 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 and then, oh, and, there, and I would like go see these movies in the theaters like four times just to see those shots again. And um, we eventually, you know, built a sort of makeshift 3D rig and started making these movies that were really, well, they were installations because we weren't just making a film. We were really, um, we were shooting in, in um, while knowing exactly what size screen we would be projecting on and where the audience would be in relation to that screen. So it was a form of projection mapping yeah. mixed with 3D. And this was an installation uh, that was really the foundation for everything we're doing today. If you look at some of the stuff we did back then, the mm -hmm. documentaries were very similar to the Nomad series, for right. example, that we did. Um, and then, of course, in 2012, I think, late 2012, uh, Palmer Lucky started his Kickstarter for the Oculus Rift. And, you know, I saw that and I was like, well, if this is really true that he could do this for 300 bucks, this might be what we've been trying to do this whole time, you know? And, but I, I couldn't believe that this was actually a thing that was going to exist for 300 bucks. It just didn't make any sense to me. But, I, you know, I ordered one and... The day I got it, I think I spent like 48 hours straight just like in VR. I got very, very sick, but it was worth it. Um, and, uh, you know, at the time it was all just tech demos, like computer generated stuff. But we thought if we could find a way to reverse engineer what we've been doing on a flat screen into a 360 degree sphere in 3D, that this would be the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. And so we started building uh, our first camera rig and then figuring out how to stitch it all together. And that was, um, and then, yeah, and then that, that led to our first test, which was actually a, a shot in a cathedral uh, with a woman just walking up and sitting next to you and looking right into the camera. You have that. I do have, a, yeah. I do have a, a snippet of that. If we can go back to video. There is no sound on this one. Or there is deep bass. <laughs> it's so dark. Yeah. I can't even see it. Mm. Can you see her? Where's the remote? Can we? The, sc the screens are a little dark.
Or turn off the lights. I don't know. Yeah. She's sitting there next to, uh, next to you. I mean, can you talk about a little bit, yeah, the, uh, the feeling that people got when they first saw this? Um, it was pretty amazing. Um, so I should say that when we were doing those installations before, people were already having pretty strange reactions. Um, you know, people would say that they felt like they were put in some kind of trance or like they had taken drugs or that they had gone through a very deeply meditative session. Um, and then with this, it was just like next level. Um, and that, that to us was like the best sign that we were on to something. Yeah. Um, people, a lot of people just completely freaked out when she looked at you. I mean, it was the first time, I think, that any medium could create that sense of presence of not just yourself in an experience, but of someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, not just the representation of someone. If, if, if an actor looks at the camera in a film, it doesn't really look like they're looking at you. Yeah. Uh, but it does in, in VR. Um, so I actually, uh, I, I snuck into um, a back, uh, back office at E3 in 2013 yeah. uh, or 14, uh, and uh, sort of barged in on Palmer Lucky and told him to see this thing, this test. And uh, that was sort of the beginning of uh, a long relationship with Oculus that, that has led actually all the way up to today. Can you talk a little bit about presence? Because um, I think that that is something that is so prevalent in all of your work. And you guys work really hard in creating that, uh, that experience for the audience. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we were trying to do from the beginning of our exploration in, in immersive mm -hmm. You know, storytelling, even when we were doing installations. Um, the idea that, you know, there's a, there's a pretty big, there's a big difference between watching something and being a part of something. Mm -hmm. And we always felt that if you're a part of something, the baseline of everything is just m much higher. So just how intense you can feel, uh, like emotions and, and your, 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 even just your attention and, and you know, Everything is just elevated, and, and the, the ceiling is elevated as well, you know? Um, nothing, none of that is guaranteed. I think, you know, the range of a movie can do that too. Yeah. And probably more easily in many ways today because we're so good at, by we I mean people, yeah. we're so good at making movies. Uh, it's been, you know, over 100 years. Yeah. Uh, um, whereas VR, well, this new wave of VR at least is less than five years or, yeah. or about five years. So. Um, I think as a medium, the potential is there to, to do some pretty amazing things. And even some of these early pieces, I think, show that potential. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, everything we do is, first and foremost, you know, we, we, we want to establish presence, which is not a given necessarily in VR. So immersion is pretty much a given because you're always surrounded in VR. Mm -hmm. But to f actually feel that you're there, you have to do a couple of things, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, you know, I think, you know, we have these questions that we yeah. ask on every project, yeah. and the first one is, who is the viewer? And the answer can be, they are themselves, in the case of most documentaries. Yeah. The answer could be, they are a character. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of Miyubi, for example, yeah. where you play a, a Japanese toy robot. Um, and, or the answer could be, you're not really there, but you have to know that, and, 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 and that comes with its own set of challenges. Um, and um, the second question is, why are you there? Mm -hmm. um, and the third is, why can't you do everything? And the question is not anything, because in, 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 an, in a linear cinematic piece, like most of the stuff that we've done in the yeah. past, um, you can't do anything, or, or bar barely anything. Um, and then in a the case of interactive experiences, you can do some things, but not everything. So the question is, why can't you do everything? Because in the real world, you can do everything within social limits, right. of course. But <laughs> you, you, you have to uh, justify that, I think, yeah. because otherwise you enter the realm of, uh, of games, which is fine. Games are great. But if you're trying to tell a story and you fall into the realm of games, but you're not making a good game, mm -hmm. that's a dangerous sort of uncanny valley between storytelling and gaming that I'm very wary of. And um, 
So, you know, all, justifying why you can only do the things you're allowed to do in an interactive piece, uh, or why you can't do anything in a, in a linear piece mm. is, is very important. And, in, and when, you were, when you think of all your projects, you, is that where you start? You start with those questions before you do anything else? Sure. I mean, you know, there will be an idea that comes yeah. from either ourselves or a collaborator. Uh, and so you know, that, that may come first. Sure. Um, in the case of Miyubi, the questions came first. Because we were like, OK, well, wh wh who are you? What are you doing there? And uh, why can't you do anything in the case of Miyubi? Because it's yeah. a linear piece, mostly. Uh, well, that led us to, well, OK, you'll be a, you know, a shitty, primitive, tiny little yeah. robot toy. Uh, and not just that, but let's go back in time to 1982 to make sure that you really can't do anything. So in, in Miyubi, you are a 1980s toy robot. And so that is the presence that you take on in that piece. Um, exactly. And so with that piece, you also started to play with interaction too, right? Yeah, a little bit. Um, so that premise also enabled some, uh, how should I say, uh, native interactivity. So you know, one thing that always bugs me if you're in a if you're a human in an interactive piece, and then all of a sudden you're given an, a binary option or something to click on as part of the experience, unless you embrace that style and you, you really go into that direction, it really, to me, just completely breaks the sense of, mm -hmm. of continuity, of flow, of realism. So the fact that you were in the mind of an, a digital, you know, of a robot, uh, allowed us to have this thin layer of interactivity, which really all it is is there's an Easter egg hunt. There are three hidden objects in the experience, and uh, seeing them, highlighting them, mm -hmm. uh, adds them to an inventory. And if you collect all three, you unlock a hidden program that your, your maker, Jeff Goldblum, uh, implanted in your brain. So it's all justified, you know, even the interface and even the, the, the icons and all that by the fact that you are embodying a robot. Yeah. So the thing I loved about that piece was the fact that Jeff Goldblum was definitely your biggest star of the piece, but you hit him completely. Yeah, so that was an, uh, another one of those, an idea that came before the actual uh, yeah. content. I, I was obsessed with the idea of getting, a, you know, uh, well, Jeff Goldblum yeah. in this case, but someone that would definitely be the, 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 the lead, like the, the biggest name in a film, and then not putting them in the film. You know, so you really you have to find, in, you know, if, you watch, if you're just watching the film, you, you know, he's just not there, and then you'll see him in the credits, or you, you, you saw him in the credits before, uh, and then you really, you're really incentivized to like to watch it again, watch it again, and 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 and, and, and find him. Yeah, and and he was a great sport with that. So, so I'd love to go back a little further to like Strangers. Um, that was the the first ever VR piece that I saw in the new wave of VR, and it was someone, uh, a good friend of mine, Ari from Missing Pieces told me it was the one thing I needed to see at uh, Tribeca. And I diverted my car going to the airport so I could go and see it. And after that, it just really, the idea of presence really took hold and, and really changed my mind towards everything. And um, can you talk a little bit about that experience and people's reactions to that? Because that was a really different kind of piece at the time. So what's funny about Strangers is we, um so after this test, the church test, we wanted to make a, an actual piece. You know, mm -hmm. this is, remained the test. And we were like, OK, well, we, let's do something that can be a single shot, because we don't, we don't know if we can or we don't want to edit. Uh, let's make it something between 5 and 10 minutes. We want to be in one place. We want it to be, and, and we want it to sustain your attention. So we, it needs to be an interesting setting with an interesting character, doing something that you could watch for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we didn't have any money, so that wouldn't cost anything, too. Yeah. So uh, we were, um, to, so, so two buddies of ours, uh, Chris and Matchek, uh, who are another directing duo um, of Clyde Henry, who do some fantastic stop motion, which we're actually doing another project with them now. But uh, so they were buddies with Patrick. Mm -hmm. And we, so we, OK, I'll, I'll skip some of the backstory. Uh, I never know, like, how far back to go in this thing. It's fine. Uh, so we, um, we, uh, we approached Patrick, sure. who's just a great character, just even when he's not playing uh, music. But you know, to have him in his studio uh, just be there and be himself and perform, or not. 
mm -hmm. you know, like, but ideally perform. And we, uh, we shot for a couple of hours. I think we got an hour and a half to two hours of, of footage. And we eventually selected the most imperfect few minutes. The, mm -hmm. So the, the, the bit that had the most flaws in it, the most, you know, he starts playing, he stops, he gets up, he's uncomfortable, he empties his pockets, he starts, he lights a cigarette, he throws his phone in the ash tree, he sits back down, he starts playing, and he eventually, one song melds into another song, and at some point his phone rings, and it was just perfect. It was just, it was so imperfect that it was perfect. And so, um, but all of this, that piece was still meant to be just a test. Yeah. So Patrick was really fascinated. He had seen the church test. He, he, he was completely blown away. And he was like, okay, let's work together and make something. So we were four directors and Patrick Watson, so four ego, five egos, yeah. just trying to create a piece where uh, you essentially don't want any of the egos to show through, except maybe Patrick's, because you, you, don't, you just want it to be the viewer and Patrick. Yeah. And so this was a test to then do something more ambitious. We are like, okay, well, and in fact, I was supposed to uh, show this, finish the eventual piece we would make after this test. To uh, we had set up a big meeting at Oculus after they'd seen the church test. Like, okay, let's you know we're going to get everyone there, and we we're going to show them this piece we're working on. And so that was the test, and then we were going to do another piece. But on this other piece, which has never seen the light of day, which was shot in a cathedral with Patrick Watson and a choir and all sorts of crazy shit, uh, we had. The, 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 we had like technical difficulties and we couldn't get the piece finished on time. And so we went and showed Oculus the test, which yeah. was Strangers, which at the time we, we didn't have a name. Uh, and they were blown away. And so we realized, okay, maybe this is, not, this is, this is more than a test. And, and, that, and then that led you guys to doing something for the launch of their next project, right? Yeah, so they asked us to make... Um, this introductory video to the Gear VR, which is the, f the first Gear VR, uh, would be, which would be the first thing anyone sees when they first plop the, the phone into the, the headset, which was kind of a montage of, uh, of clips that we shot around the world. In fact, we had two and a half weeks to, to travel the world, shoot these shots, post-produce, package it all, and then distribute it on a new piece of hardware, n none of which we had ever done before. There must, there, must have been a, there must have been an interesting experience. <laughs> Same, yeah. How did you pick where you were going and what was the, what was the ideas behind those things? Um, originally, we just wanted to make an experience in the yurt. Mm -hmm. That was our initial pitch. Mm -hmm. but, um, the, and the, but they wanted us to do like 25 shots, like, like a kind of a machine gun yeah. edit style. And then the compromise ended up being like five or six or seven shots. Uh, which was, you know, okay, well, let's get a variety of, of things. We, we want them all to be very immersive and, and, and respect everything that we've figured out so far, which was basically let's treat the camera as a person, put them in a, in a setting that, where they could be, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all the questions that, you know, even though we hadn't probably formulated it in our heads as, as uh, clearly as I, I formulated before, the yeah. three questions, we, we had a sense that that's what we needed to do. So we did that on, on a series of shots that would give you a chance to experience different things and then put, you know, kind of pack, and, package it all together. And you guys have your own camera system, right? And you, de you developed that and you, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I mean, we had no choice. But when yeah. we did it, when we first started, there was no camera that we could use. Um, and so we designed our, our first camera, we designed the post-production mm -hmm. pipeline and we wrote some software. Uh, and then as time went on, we just kept improving it because, you know, we, and then we, we, we raised some money, we built a team, got some real engineers and real coders <laughs> and, and just kept going. Uh, and then what happened was once cameras started coming out, um, we had no reason to, to stop using our own because we controlled every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we knew it intimately and, and we could improve it and, and tweak it in any way we liked. Uh, for any shoot we did, and so we're now at the fourth generation of our of our camera, uh, and uh, our the whole you know efficiency has been you know improving nonstop in, for five years. So, uh, if a camera ever comes out that 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 that's better or that you know does light field or something that that we're not doing yet, um, then we'll just use that. But that hasn't happened yet. So, how do you and uh, how do you and Felix work together? Um, 
So it was a tough one to answer. So Felix and I, so I'm, I, okay. So our studio is really, you know, art meets tech, and I know it's yeah. cliche, but it, it is. I mean, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't do anything where we did if those two things weren't like really intimately um, connected. So I like to think that I'm right in the middle mm -hmm. of that, uh, and Felix is more uh, creative leaning, and our CTO, Sebastian Silwan, is at the is, is at the tech end, but both Felix and Sebastian, so Felix also has a tech side and Sebastian has a creative side. Uh, and so the three of us, and of course everyone else in the studio, but you know, at the, at kind of at the forefront of like the tech creative, that's kind of how things are, okay, are spread cool. out, yeah. So can you, can you talk about, uh, we're gonna talk about two or three of the, there are three pieces here that are playing, which is the Isle of Dogs piece, Space Explorers and Jurassic Park. Let's talk about the first two first. Um, can you talk about the challenge of doing the Isle of Dogs piece because it's a stop motion animation piece yeah. by Wes Anderson. How did you go about thinking about what you were gonna do for that? Um, so this was actually Wes's idea. He wanted to make a, um, a sort of a, a behind the scenes that wasn't really behind the scenes and it, but that was a piece and a behind the scenes at the same time. So we were like, okay, that sounds crazy, but sure. Um, so we went uh, to London where they were shooting and we looked at the sets and we just started you know, figuring out like, what, what can we do here? And so, I mean, it, 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 pretty, it was pretty organic. I mean, it was pretty obvious that you know, the sets that, they, that are built are already, you know, they're just for one direction because they're always just for the frame. And when you look behind you, you just see the studio. So you know, short of building entirely new sets that were 360, there was no way around mm -hmm. the piece being what it is. Yeah. Um, so what we had to figure out is, well, exactly what we're gonna do mm -hmm. within that context. Um, Wes uh, started interviewing or getting the, the audio for the, for the dogs, uh, which, you know, was actually shot, uh, was, were recorded by the actors uh, by themselves on their phones. So we had oh, wow. all sorts of, like, quality, um, if you if you watch the piece, um, Ed Norton's character, yeah. you know there's a actually a boom mic in the shot in the animation because he, when he was recording himself, he just, he just kept like you know, hearing <laughs> yeah. this, so you just see the dog like bumping against the mic. Or uh, Bill Murray shot himself or recorded himself in uh, in a cab or something, yeah. and so you hear the the traffic. So we put his character in one of those trash trams from the movie, yeah. so you could you know so the motor is justified. And then we just, okay, obviously we had to figure out how to do um, stop motion in VR. That's, <laughs> we had yeah. never done that. So we created a virtual version of our virtual reality camera using the camera of the movie. So mm -hmm. using the DSLR that they used yeah. to shoot the actual film, we programmed it to, to kind of virtually, since it's stop motion yeah. and nothing's moving, we could shoot all the cameras of our camera, yeah. all the angles of our camera separately with a right. motorized rig. So we kind of hacked Dragon, which is yeah. an animation software, stop motion animation software, uh, to do that. But we also created a minuscule version of part of our VR camera because there were also humans in the shot and humans were moving. So we had to shoot those for real. Yeah. And, and then, because it was a time lapse of, of the animators. Yeah. So we also had that part of it. And then we kind of just kind of put it all together. Yeah. And Space Explorer seems to be one of your more ambitious projects. And it's how many parts is it? We're playing one of the parts here. Uh, so part two is coming out shortly. Yeah. Uh, this is part one. Each episode is about 20 minutes. Uh, it was uh, created in collaboration with Sp uh, NASA and SpaceX. Uh, and as the title implies, it's it's about space exploration. Episode one is about astronaut training. You know, for us. You know, when we started working with NASA, it was about, obviously the dream is to shoot in space, yep. but that's a journey both for us to get there yeah. and for just people, you know, a astronauts, but the audience as well. So the plan was, okay, well, let's take it step by step. Let's take it from regular people or becoming astronauts. Uh, uh, part two is about uh, the collaboration between the public and the private sector and the, diff and the different nations uh, and then take off, and then in the future, um, you know, see what happens. Let's see what happens. So, um, 
And with uh, the Jurassic Park piece, this is the second collaboration with ILM, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. So um, Jurassic World Apatosaurus, yeah. which we did in 2015, um, we collaborated with a, a ILM before the ILM X Lab uh, even existed, uh, and it was their first VR piece, uh, and uh, it, it was our first time combining CG with live action, their first time as well. So we. we We'd done a lot of figuring things out together. Mm -hmm. uh, and on this new piece, Jurassic World Blue, um, we wanted to step it up on uh, pretty much every level. We, you know, more dinosaurs, more uh, camera movement, and we've, there's a lot of technological innovation in, in, in the piece, for example. Uh, this is a detail for most people, but uh, it is the first time where you actually have depth at the nadir, which is when you look down. Normally, yeah. you, in our pieces, we, we either have a black hole or, um, well, actually, we usually have a black hole. Um, but uh, usually you can fill that, but you could never really fill it properly because, you know, uh, just the nature of stereoscopic images, when you're looking forward, you can, you know, assign a left image to your left eye, a right image to your right eye. But when you're looking down, there's no telling which way the viewer is going to be oriented. So you can't have a video image there that's going to show you real 3D. Sure. So we developed a way to do that on top of the fact that the camera's moving and they're tr tracking CG dinosaurs while making camera move in the forest and with the giant rig that we had to erase. And so it was pretty crazy. It was pretty crazy. Uh, so I want to start to take some questions from the audience, but there was someone who couldn't make it that has sent in a, a video question. Could we uh, play that for us, please? Soy Juan Antonio Bayona, director de Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom y realmente me encantaría estar ahí con todos vosotros en el Sonar disfrutando de esta presentación de realidad virtual de Jurassic World. Eh, yo la he disfrutado ya y es apasionante, es eh, increíble poder introducirse en el mundo de los dinosaurios de esa manera. Así que nada, disfrutarlo, que vaya muy bien la presentación, me encantaría estar ahí, pero estoy haciendo promoción de Jurassic por todo el mundo. Y antes de despedirme, una pregunta muy sencilla. ¿Cómo, a Félix y a Paul, ¿cómo creéis que eh, la realidad virtual va a influenciar al mundo del cine? Muchas gracias y hasta pronto. Nice. So, what do you think about his question? Um, I'm pretty bullish when it comes to VR, obviously. Um, I can't put a date on it, but you know, a lot of people say VR is not going to replace cinema and things like that. I think it will. I, I think it's pretty inevitable that at some point, uh, maybe not in as long as we might think, uh, it will. I mean, two, two, and a, two, and a half, two years, two and a half years ago, everyone thought that by 2019, 2018, VR would be everywhere, and now people aren't so sure. Uh, I think there was a lot of hype thinking that, okay, well, this new medium is going to take over. And, you know, we, we started this far back enough where there was no hype to know, to, to, to have, you know, we, we always started, we built this company with a very long term perspective mm. um, because it's such a radically different medium that on a creative and technological level, it's going to take a long time to figure a lot of stuff out. But as we do, uh, I just cannot imagine a world in the near to midterm future where we're still just looking at rectangles, flat, you know, flat images on rectangles uh, as our main way of consuming entertainment, interacting with the internet, socially, what it, name it, any sort of digital, you know, um, it doesn't mean that they're going to get wiped out, but I think that it, it, you know, it's called virtual reality because it, it it takes the digital and brings it into the world as we experience it, as we understand it. Yeah. We don't have this, this limiting abstraction of the content. Mm -hmm. So I think that gradually VR and AR are going to just make things so much better, everything, it, it, just in terms of how we interact with them, more immersive, more, just more pleasant you know, to use than the, these flat screens. So, and, 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 and films. You know? now, the question is, and I don't have the answer to that, but is the type, you know, we've done a lot of linear filmed VR where you can't interact, and then there's also a lot of interactive VR. 
uh, which we're also developing and very interested in, but will non-interactive, more cinema-like VR, is, is that the future of cinema? Right. Or is it going to be purely interactive? Uh, I think that's the question. I don't think it's if. I think it's what it's kind right. of VR is going to replace cinema. Uh, I like to think that linear is going to be a thing. Yeah. I think, I mean, personally, I'm just as fascinated by that today as I was five, five years ago. Uh, and as, as much as I am fascinated by the interactive stuff. Uh, so I think it'd be sad to see that not, not survive. But depending on who you ask, there's a lot of people who think that that's the stopgap towards a fully interactive you know, future. Sure. I'm not, I don't know. I mean, there's, when video games came out, movies didn't stop existing. Mm -hmm. you know? So I don't see why that would be necessarily the case with VR. We don't always want to be active participants in our entertainment. Um, unless we, re we radically change as a culture, yeah. um, which we already need to do to adopt VR. I think that's one of the big limiting factors today is it's such a different type of consumption of content with this headset, which itself needs to evolve and become more transparent, both sure. literally and figuratively. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's great. That's my answer to that. <laughs> Anybody have any questions in the audience? We have a couple minutes for some. Right in the front here. Thank you, Bayona. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Paul. Um, I wonder how you think that uh, interactive 360 video, uh, not VR or AR, but interactive 360 video, the use of hotspots and storyscaping, um, how you think that will develop in terms of storytelling and what challenges that throws up for both um, immersive filmmakers and also for audiences? Um. I'm um, not sure how to answer that. I mean, we, we haven't really done 360 video, uh, per, you know, like, uh, on, on a screen, really. I mean, we have released versions of some of our pieces as 360 videos. Um, so I'm, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer that. I, I, the only time we even did interactive 360 video was in Miyubi, and it wasn't so much uh, in, to make a branching narrative as it was, like I said earlier, since you're in the body of a robot, you can have this interface, and it's fully integrated into the story. Um, and otherwise, I, you know, I, I, I've sort of shy away from things that are just binary uh, and, and with hotspots that aren't really justified by, you know, if you're just, uh, you know, a, you're, you're following a protagonist, some, some human being, <laughs> and they have to choose between path A and path B, and then stopping the experience, or even if you don't stop it, but you, 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 you pop up yeah. these things. I feel, I don't know how, I don't know, that feels a little clunky to me. Um, but again, I'm maybe not the person to, 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 to make that, uh, to make do that the best version of that. So, um, I don't know, no, yeah. I think with, um, with your style, because the, the immersion is so, Important that perhaps it was yeah yeah it was the wrong question to ask. <laughs> no problem. Any Sorry. anybody else have any questions? The front row here. Hi there. So I'd like to ask about um, kind of distributing content and how you see um, the future of immersive storytelling kind of progressing in terms of um, like location-based content. So. Would you say that we need more headsets in people's hands to enjoy um, more immersive storytelling, or do you think we need more location-based places where you can go watch things? You know, where you go to a movie theater, you kind of do the same thing, such as like the IMAX, um, the IMAX location where you can go watch things or interact. Yeah, but you need both. Uh, I think you know the release of the Oculus Go is a great step towards getting more headsets into people's hands. I, I, I think that headsets need to keep evolving quite a bit more for us to expect everyone to have them, just as we have smartphones. Um, and they have to merge with augmented reality. And, and in fact, uh, I think one of the th limiting factors is the fact that when you, you know, going from real life to VR is a dramatic shift. You know, you have to stop what you're doing, put on a headset, and you go somewhere else. Uh, with, if, if we get to the point, which could happen pretty soon, where, you know, a pair of glasses like the one you're wearing now can do AR and VR, then you're already wearing the device. You can go from slight virtual, well, augmented reality, so virtual elements in your world that 
can take you somewhere else if you need to and then gradually bring you back. Just, just that, to me, is a better ramp, way better ramp into content. We also need a VR to become slash AR, MR, to become more essential. Uh, you know, right now it's fun, you know, to make this stuff and it's fun to watch it, but um, there's not much m else to do with it. In fact, I think I said this earlier, if you decided to take two weeks off and, ex and dive, deep dive into VR today, you may well be able to see everything that was ever made, you know, and more or less, uh, depending on how long you play those games. But um, you, we need more, better content. We need the equivalent of our social networks and platforms and, um, again, there's moral questions there too, but if we're just looking at it from a purely, you know, adopt, adoption perspective, you know, we need all those things to happen. And then uh, for the LBE, absolutely, I think, you know, that's what we're doing here. Um, I think we're also thinking about a lot of um, content that's really made for LBE. Um, and, and some more hybrid content that is maybe very much optimized for LBE, but also um, can be watched at home, you know? Um, and this is along the spectrum of VR, AR, MR as well. Uh, making pieces that can maybe scale down to an iPhone, you know, an augmented reality piece for Magic Leap that also can be mass distributed on an iPhone. It's not the full experience, but it's still pretty cool, you know? So that's, that's some of the things I think that, that are important. And in the, in the future, I think it, it also needs to be both because you don't want to, you know, it's like anything today, you have the home version and you often have the public social version, which often is a higher end or somehow more premium version of what you can do at home. Well, I think that's a great place to end. We are uh, out of time. Thank you all for coming and thank you so much, Paul, for being here on pleasure. your birthday. Thanks for having me.